my name is Cecilia Nyokabi. Um, I double up as a trainer and a certified life coach. Um, I've basically been on this journey of training and leadership for the past, um, for the past so 10 years or so. Uh, my child's name is Asha Gidenji Masharia. Um, he's actually just turned um, two months um, a week ago. Um, he's quite a curious little child, clearly sleepy, <laughs> um, but all is well. Wow, um, I don't know where to begin. Um, I think for me, my journey to motherhood was unexpected if I can put it like that. Um, because first and foremost, for me, one thing that I had been told um, over a long period of time um, was that I could not get pregnant. Um, from the age of 17, 16, it was really hard for me to even men to have menses because I would have menses on and off and then it was something that at that point in time I didn't my parents didn't understand and it wasn't something that they could explain so they were like these things happen naturally it'll just you know come into age and that um, just went on for periods of time uh, all the way through high school all the way through campus all the way through campus so just finding just being able to just figure out what was going on took when I was a bit older and when I could go out and just seek medication for myself um, various doctors kept saying um, hi you can't you know you need to just take be on this um, contraceptives the pills and then it'll help regulate your menses so I did that and then it was okay for a while then when you got off them they would be all over the place again so nothing was really working so I remember that point in time I had my partner and I went to get um, checked and what happened is um, at least they cleared me they said you don't have cancer or anything that would stop you from getting pregnant but it's going to be a challenge okay so for several years or something that we wanted um, with the person I was dating at that point in time but it never worked out so eventually we got to the point I got to the point where I just used to tell him oh, I'm never gonna get pregnant it's just I'm over it I'm over it and I'm over it so we so I moved on mentally and he emotionally from the situation um, and then um, so what I did is I focused on my career because having done um, leadership coaching I just focused on that and just tried to do anything I could do with regards to that and just push my career and just put that to the side because then again there's so much in society um, with regards to judgment about um, about basically a woman who can't have children the importance of children you see so I didn't want to have to deal with that so I decided let me just build my career instead so I put a lot of effort into my work and um, I, I've been where I've been working for the past um, say two years plus as I from the bottom up and I really really did enjoy that journey and um, so I was actually I found I was pregnant in November um, last year but first it started off as a false negative so I just got home um, took a test and everything was like no you're not pregnant then the next week I took a test and I was positive so I was thrown off because I was like how do you go from a false negative to a positive and then you have to figure out how to tell your partner I'm pregnant and they know the pregnancy thing is not in the picture um, so I went on to just accept it at that point in time because I was too shocked to come to a decision. Um, then as we went on, um, what happened is I started having bleeding. So I was at work um, in December and I started having bleeding and I had to be rushed to the hospital. So I went to hospital and I was there for over two hours. I was in extreme pain and I was bleeding. So the doctor diagnosed me with um, what they term medically as a threatened abortion. And they said I needed to go to another specialist to check me and confirm if um, the pregnancy was going to be terminated naturally or what was going to happen. Um, so I went to another specialist. He told me that you need to be on bed rest completely. <laughs> Hi, um, that I needed to be on bed rest completely while um, another doctor w told me that you need to be up and down. Then another doctor told me that regardless of what you do, if your pregnancy is going to come out, it's going to come out. There's nothing you're going to do. Whether you walk around, whether you stay in bed, it is going to happen. So having each doctor tell me a different thing was also stressful in itself. So I left, I went to stay with my mother for a month and all I did was basically, because I was in a state of depression, all I did was eat and sleep, eat and sleep. And she didn't know what was going on exactly because being told that you, you are pregnant but you might not be able to carry the pregnancy to term so early, you don't want to say anything because it will, it might actually affect things. 
when you're pregnant for the first few um, weeks or months, you don't say anything. That is what the culture is. Don't tell anyone you're pregnant too soon. If you say anything too soon, anything can happen. And your pregnancy can actually, and what about if it comes out? So what, what next? How do you tell people that? And I was like, I don't understand. So I need support and I need help. And I can't tell anyone because society says that you need to keep a pregnancy up, up uh, you know, wrapped up so you don't have to, you know, deal with the aftermath of what if something goes wrong. So I decided, okay, fine. Uh, and then, of course, we went on. I uh, was extremely sick, um, got back to work. Despite the fact that my pregnancy was so high risk, at the end of the day, I realized I could not step away from my work on, on account of being pregnant. It was a decision that I had to make um, personally that was really, really hard. And the first thing that happened when I got back to work is I had high blood pressure and I was extremely swollen and I barely could walk. So every single, so throughout my whole pregnancy, not only did I um, just go through such a hard time, it was even hard to work. It was hard to walk. Um, another thing that happened is there's usually this thing they call the mask of pregnancy whereby you have, you know, there's changes in your complexion, changes in your body and everything of the sort. So for me, it was extreme. I was swollen, my face, my nose, my feet, my hands. I couldn't wear shoes. I had to walk around in bathroom slippers at work. I, as a trainer, you're constantly standing and speaking to people and you, you know, it's only as effective as when you're up and down versus <laughs> when you're up and down versus when you're seated. So you have to, you're training and you have to tell them that, hey, bear with me. I might need to, you know, I might need to have a seat for a few minutes, but you get through it. And I'm appreciative because um, my, the people I worked with um, encouraged me and supported me through the whole process. I was exhausted and they just walk with me and they'd rub my back and I I appreciate that and then I remember what I'm grateful for is that my boss my immediate boss actually sent me on forced leave she was like you have to go you have been up and down for over six seven months and you keep doing this and like you're not pregnant but you are pregnant you are swollen we see you are tired I would come into the office I want to go back home I would I wanted to cry and people would be like please don't cry and I'd be like okay don't cry and then I go I go up into a room of over a hundred people and I take them through training every single week I do it over and over and over and over it was taking such a big toll on me um, so she sent me on forced leave, so I went home. Um, that Saturday I had a clinic attendance. I remember my gynecologist looking at me and being like, Bado? And I'm like, nope. He's like, okay, let's check you. So my blood pressure was extremely high. I remember I think it was around 139 to 140 at that point in time. And the doctor was like, this is too high. So I'm giving you um, one day. If you don't go into labor naturally, we're going to have to rush you to hospital. So I took one day, then I took my blood pressure again. It was around 157 still high, no labor pains, nothing. So the doctor called me and was like, Cecilia, what's going on? And I was like, um, nothing doc, because basically I have no labor pains, but I check my blood pressure and is really, really high. So um, he was like, I want to deliver you now. And now the problem is this, um, a couple of years back, I'd had surgery to for removal of my gallbladder because I had gallstones. Um, in between my surgery, my anesthesia wore off. And I woke up in the middle of my surgery being cut. It was the most painful thing that I had ever gone through. So for my doctor to tell me that he might rush me for surgery, I was, I could not, I, I started panicking. So I could not say yes. So I was like, um, just give me like tonight. If it doesn't happen, I'm coming in tomorrow. So um, that was, I think, on um, the 29th of July. So I just said, let me just give this the, tonight and then tomorrow I have to go in for surgery. So um, the next morning I went to hospital. I remember walking in and just, I walked to the recipient and I was like, um, I'm here to deliver. They're like, are you in labor? I'm like, no, but the doctor said I need to be checked for my blood pressure and also check my, um, hello, check my blood pressure and also um, have an ultrasound. So they checked me, they checked my blood pressure, they immediately admitted me and said, you should not even be walking. We don't know how you're standing, you could be, you could collapse at any point in time. It's very shocking that you're walking around, like this is, you, like you, you are too far along in your pregnancy, anything could go wrong, we don't know how you've gotten to where you are at, the, at this point in time. So I said, okay, fine. So I had my ultrasound um, and then the next thing I know, nurses are rushing 
towards me they have a bunch of papers four to six papers they're like um what's your name asking me so many questions um and then i'm like what's going on and they're like we'll tell you but first you need to get dressed you need to go to theater right now i'm like no explain to me they're like we'll explain after we finish filling the forms so everything is filled my doctor walks in and he's like cecilia meet you in theater and he walks and i'm like no wait what's going on he tells me um uh, there's a problem with your pregnancy um your child's um, heart rate is dropping by the minute we need to deliver you right now so at that point in time i'm like i have no choice i have to accept that this is the situation so um i go to theater and i remember I, I had anesthesia, I had like around six doctors, there was a pediatrician, the gynecologist, an assistant, a nurse, and I was there and then of course my feet went numb and, the, and, I, and I just said, I can't do this. I said, I'm out. So I did shaking, wriggling, I was like, I'm not doing this. It had, they had to like hold me down and they had to like talk to me and be like, Cecilia, um, your child is in danger, we need to deliver you now, you need to be calm. You need to just let this happen. And then I remember telling the doctor, I was like, if I feel pain, because the last time I was on an operating table, Atua told me something and it went the opposite way. We are going to have a problem when I'm able to walk. <laughs> um, and then I remember just going, just being, just removing myself mentally from the situation. I just stopped um, focusing on what was going on. I just turned to the whoever was assisting and I was like, hi, what's your name? How long have you been working here? Because I was over it. I was I was scared. I didn't know what to do. I was not going to sit there and just wait. So I just told them, oh, what, what are you doing? What have you been here for? How long have you been here for? Um, what's your name? Then they're saying, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Give me some water. Okay, I'm, I'm, I need water. Doc, if you're going to deliver me, I need water. I just, it was just, I was just unmanageable at that point in time. And they gave me water, weird enough. Um, and then... <laughs> <laughs> and then um, in a few minutes I heard a cry and then I was like um, is that my baby they were like no that's not your baby oh okay so when is my baby coming oh. uh, like I was out of my own body I was like I was not even what, aware of what's going on then after a few minutes the pediatrician came well I was just still on the operating table and she told me um, the baby is okay but there was just a slight problem um, there's a problem with his breathing so we put him on oxygen for we put him on oxygen for a couple of minutes, might be a couple of hours, but we think everything is going to go on well. So um, just uh, make sure that you just, you know, you're mentally prepared and you're okay for whatever comes next. I was like, fine, no problem. They stitched me up and then we were done. Of course, I saw him for like a microsecond and then he was gone. And then I saw him later for after around we had enough around six to nine hours when I saw him later for the very first time. And I remember he came in and they gave him to me and I was like, okay, hi. I didn't have breast milk. So I was like, okay, you can take him now. And they're like, no, when we give you the baby, you see the baby. I'm like, what do you mean? I thought they go to the nursery and stay there where they are safe, where people who know how to handle babies handle them. And then when I'm going, I, I take over. They're like, no, here's your baby. Now just start bonding and start breastfeeding. And that was hard because I had no idea. Because having not ever thought of pregnancy before, I never knew anything about babies. Like, how do you make, how does breast milk come up? You know, I knew nothing of that situation. And so I was like, okay, so how is breast milk supposed to come out? Well, how do I do this? Then mom was like, you didn't do this and this before. I was like, no. I was like, okay, who was I supposed to learn it from? I'm the first daughter, so. I clearly have no one to ask and we live in extremely different towns and I'm usually extremely busy so I didn't and I thought it was a natural thing that you give birth and then milk comes and she was like no it doesn't work like that <laughs> so it was very shocking for me um during that period um of course having your parents there it's a big it's a big plus they support you I remember even though I had um you know my stitches my wound was very very painful you know I had the support when the baby was crying and I couldn't because you know when the baby is crying you can't like dash up and just grab him as quick as you can every getting up is a process you know um sitting up is a process holding him is a process everything is so much slower so I had, you know, my family that support me through that and I'm so grateful. So during that um, one and a half um, months, it was really, really, really hard. 
to be honest because um you need that support you need someone to talk to who is beside your parent because the thing is um we always say we have um circles of intimacy circles whereby you keep people you know the most inner circle is for your partner it's not for your parents because there are things you would tell your partner and not tell your parent there's that so at that point in time i didn't have that someone in my inner circle his father was not there so i could tell him like this is how i'm feeling this is how i'm exhausted i am this is how hard this is for me and he understood everything because we used to talk so i used to tell him how hard this was for me because i remember um of course you know a baby is only crying you under, you assume it's only diapers or milk so i'm feeding him i'm feeding him i'm feeding him then i put him to sleep and then he regurgitates milk I was I was so shocked. I started crying. I'm like, I just killed my baby. I'm going to kill my baby with milk. Wow. I was just I was crying. I was hysterical. I was like, and then my mom just held him and was like, oh, this things happen. This things happen. I'm like, what do you mean this things happen? Why is there not a manual on this things happen that you would think would kill your child but would not kill your child? So it was really scary for me, and not having someone somewhere there, just extremely close to me who could help me was hard in itself. Um, so I remember it got to a point whereby I was not sleeping well, um, I was not eating so well. Um, they had to like literally like force me day to day to ensure I kept up with my fluids. So it got to a point that it was extremely un un unmanageable. I would walk past water, I'd think of him drowning, I'd walk past a stove, I'd think of him burning, I'd hold him, I'd think of dropping him. So it was extremely bad and I couldn't, and then I felt I could not tell my parents. So I reached out to someone who was a coach, um, as I am, um, and I told him, I told I don't know how to do this. I don't think I can do this. I'm freaking out. I'm not sleeping. Um, I'm having um, I'm having situations where I feel my child is in constant danger. And he was like, um, he's married, so he was like, just what you need to do, find someone who you trust, leave them with the baby, just step out. You need to be alone for a few minutes. You need to gather your thoughts. You need to take care of you for a few minutes, then come back to the baby. And he told me that it's not selfish because he has a wife and kids, so he understands how important it is for my own mental health to take care of myself as I do that for the baby. So I did that. I left, went to get my hair done, and I remember when I was walking to the hair salon, I was walking so slowly, but the journey back, I was sprinting back home. I was like, is he okay? But it helped. It helped so much to do that. Then what I did after that was I decided to leave. I decided, I told my parents I need to go back to my own space. I need to go back to my own home because I need to spend time with my son. I need to get to know him. I need to know what to do next. I need to be able to now start making decisions without necessarily thinking of so many people and so many opinions. Because I believe um, as a mother, I know what would be best for him. And I believe that I want to make the right decisions for him. And I need to do that on my own. I, because you cannot hold my hand the whole way. So uh, my parents supported me, so they assisted me, and then I moved from where I lived to here because I needed also somewhere that was extremely safe, extremely quiet, extremely peaceful, that I didn't have people walking in and out. Because previously, of course, where I used to live, because I assumed I'm not going to get pregnant, was a very carefree environment, very single friendly. And then now I needed somewhere that was a bit, had a bit of sense of stability. So I moved and then I came here and the only people who knew where I lived were now my family and just me. And I told them I just need that, I need that space. And um, that helped so much because I only had like two weeks and I felt better. I felt I could make such better decisions. I felt in touch with him now. I understand him so much more when he went for his vaccination. I was sitting there because I just, I didn't even look at him, I just held him look the other way and they and he cried and I was like hmm and we got this and he was so much better within a day but everyone kept saying he's going to cry all night he's going to be swollen and I'm like I cannot relate because I now understood my child because I understood how he was his personality and everything else and so for me that has been that pregnancy journey that was how it was to where it is right now but the thing that I've learned so much is that the support system that someone can have during that period is very, very important. Not just your partner, but also the people around you, the people you talk to every single day, the people you work with. Um, because now, for me, I got so much support from the people I worked with that I cannot put it in words. Because when I felt like giving up, they would tell me one more day, one more day, one more day. So I'm walking to the office, someone is saying one more day, I'm like, 
I'm six months pregnant, what do you mean one more day? I'm, I, I am so tired. Because by the time I was getting to deliver, I was like, everyone was saying, you're almost there, you're almost there. I'm like, it's almost right now. So many times, yeah, we forget the roles that men play, okay, in pregnancy, in motherhood. Um, because what I can say is I received support from, you know, his father in a way that I think I would, I say that I'm grateful for. Because he knew how hard it was for me to get pregnant, then to find out I'm pregnant, then to help me understand and accept it. Because I remember for the past one month, I was crying so much, I was sleeping so much. He just, he, he even just used to message and be like, are you okay? Are you home? Are you not home? You know, because at, th at that point in time, I just needed that space. But then again, I needed that space, but I needed that support. So you don't know how to communicate. I need you, but I don't need you. So, you know, just, you know, just test the waters and see, is it today that you need me or is it tomorrow? So just be able to do that. And then, of course, with that comes society playing the role of um, how can you be, you know, a woman raising a child on your own, you know, where's the father, such questions. And then having to explain that, hey, this is the situation, this is a very abrupt and very sudden and very unexpected situation, but this is what it is. And this is the decision moving forward, yeah? His parents are always going to be there. Okay, but we are going to take it a step at a time because we're in a society whereby so many things have changed. There's so many different types of families. But the thing is, you need to understand that the best decision has to come from two people who have a child because you only observers looking in. You don't know um, the course of the relationship. You don't know the nature of the relationship. You don't know how it got to where it got to. You don't know the understanding. You don't know um, the different dynamics. You don't know the different ideas of parenthood from both people you don't know the understanding of life what do they believe when it comes to morals and principles we look at only one side of we want the child to have a belonging a family but you don't look at who is raising them what values are they instilling that's something else to look at and that's something we discuss and I was like moving forward there are a lot of things that you might find weird about what I say but I'm saying it because I believe we need to do things differently, okay? Uh, and men are so important in the role that they play with their children. So whoever's raising their child, whether you're raising them um, with your partner, without your partner, one of the things that I think I've come to understand is you need to not, and I think maybe say maybe even never, um, is never force, okay, your partner, okay, to have to play that role because they are part and part and parcel of the child. So you as a parent, as a mother, you need to keep the door open. If they want to walk in and get to, you know, know, build and nurture their child, let it be out of their own free will because then they will give the very best of themselves to your child. However, if you do force it, they will give what you want them to give and they won't give themselves because it's a, we say being present. Being present means being there, committing your time, committing your energy.